welcome everyone this evening um, to, I think this is our fifth, is our fifth uh, Wild About Devon webinar. <coughs> so we're holding these fortnightly and this evening we are going to be talking, well I'm not going to be talking, but we're welcoming some very learned, knowledgeable people to talk about meadows and long grass in public green spaces and managing them. So uh, first of all, we've got Tracy Hampston from uh, More Meadows, who's going to be talking to you all about More Meadows and what they've been doing and um, the sort of community side of stuff and how it's set up. Very exciting indeed. Um, then we'll stop and take questions. So if you, I think probably the best way for questions, if you just put your, use the little hand function, but you can also put questions in the chat box as well and we'll pick those up. Um, and then we'll be uh, hearing from David, who is from Exeter Diocese from the Living Churchyards Project. He's be talking all about managing um, grasslands or meadows in churchyards as well. So very exciting. I um, hope you enjoy it. And I shall open it up. Tracy, if you'd like to, if you'd like to go. Okay. okay. Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Mike. And um, I'm just going to put my screen up. Minimize that. Okay, can you all see that? Okay, that good thumbs up. Excellent. Okay, so um, so yeah, I'm Tracy, and I have been involved with grassland restoration and monitoring probably for about the last thirteen years as a conservation officer for Wild Planet Trust based at Painton Zoo. But I actually joined More Meadows. Um, as a way to find out a bit more about what other people were doing, which is pretty key to the group, I think. Um, and that was after having attended a really inspiring talk by George Peterkin in our local village hall in 2015. So um, this is me and this is Donna Cox, who's one of the co-founders of More Meadows, the Dartmoor group. And I'm just going to give you a bit of background about the, the, the original kind of More Meadows group and how it started and um, also a bit more about the recent developments of the Meadow Makers Forum, sort of wider network of more meadows, and a bit about how you can get involved or even set up your own group. I'm not going to go into detail about the restoration process, because I think that's a whole kind of evening of itself, but I'm happy to kind of answer any questions about that at the end, if, um, if you like. So where do we start? Um, all the best stories start with this. Um, this is what it's all about, really. And sites like this amazing meadow um, would have been a lot more commonplace in the past. And I thought it was quite helpful just to have a, a brief sort of think about what actually is a meadow. What do we mean by a meadow is it has kind of various definitions. And traditionally, it would have been a grassland that was cut for hay um, that was used for fodder, for winter fodder for livestock. And sometimes the it would have been grazed and sometimes not. And often it would have been a mixture of both of those depending on circumstances, weather um, and that kind of thing. And a lot of these old grasslands were quite species rich. They had a lot of different species of grasses and um, flowering, other flowering plants. And they generally had very little input in the way of fertilizers. So it would have been just a bit of animal manure probably to um, maintain a crop of hay. Um, but these days, meadows come to mean, and this is a, a George Peterkin kind of definition, really, it's come to mean flower-rich grassland of all kinds, whether it's mown, grazed or both. And we can also include in that um, things like culm grassland or rust pasture um, and calcareous grassland, um, which can all be quite species rich. And the number of species that you find in these types of grassland will depend very much on the soil type. Um, the management of them, so that's historic and the current management, and the fertility, which is the key thing. Um, and it's probably also worth mentioning at this point that um, it's very much a man-made habitat. I think when people talk about letting things go wild and they, they might think about meadows, but actually meadows are a product of, you know, um, quite a specific management, really. So I've put a few facts. Um, this is from the um, plant conservation charity plant life but these are the kind of things that we see quite a lot and I don't think I really need to tell you about sort of losses of um, invertebrate and plant species but it is quite dramatic um, and primarily this loss has 
come about through changes in agriculture, uh, alongside increasing productivity of our agricultural land. And this is a little graph from State and Nature Report um, back in um, 2019. Um, it just shows that kind of increase in productivity. So trying to get more, um, more crop. So often that's kind of silage. It's also, um, Another thing to mention that losses of these kind of meadows can come about through abandonment. Um, and that's more relevant probably to other European countries where people have moved away from farming and into the cities and they've just been left. Um, and then, you know, eventually they'll turn into sort of scrub and, and woodland habitats um, and losing that kind of particular sort of precious kind of mix. So, this means that sites like this wonderful meadow on Dartmoor are real kind of cause for celebration. And I thought I can't talk to you about meadows without sneaking in some nice pictures of some orchids and things. So we've got a southern marsh orchid here and a um, bit of yellow rattle down the bottom there and a bit of oxide daisy about to come into flower. So these are all quite typical plants of um, some types of meadows. And some of the Dartmoor meadows that might have colm grass and rust pasture on them may have marsh fertility. So uh, it's often associated with those kind of grasslands, although uh, it's generally they are found where um, there's an abundance of the larval food plant, which is devil's bit scabious. Um, so this is one of our rarer butterflies in the UK, and there are sites on Dartmoor managed um, just for this lovely lovely butterfly and not to forget the birds that depend on the abundance of insect life that really abound in some of these meadows they are kind of full of life full of plant species insects um, and here the swallows are taking advantage of kind of a swarm of insects and their place will be taken by bats probably in the evening so they're really kind of great you know for wildlife um, and also for people as well so some of you might recognise some of the people in this photo. So and more meadows, I think, has really tapped into this desire from people to know more and do better, as well as kind of join together as well and celebrate the beauty of these few remaining jewels in our landscape. And it's really about inspiring others to join us and, and maybe rethink about what they do with their grasslands. So, so more meadows. Um, Probably a lot of you are quite familiar with the group, but if you're not, um, it's a it's a community based group. It's completely reliant on the voluntary time for the people that are part of that group. So it has a steering group that put in a lot of time to, to make it work. Um, so it's Dartmoor based. So this is um, primarily about um, grasslands on Dartmoor. Um, and there's a few little sort of facts and figures at the bottom there. So there's a, a lot of members or supporters um, and we have quite a lot of lands now registered with members across Dartmoor. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So the, it started really around a kitchen table, apparently, this is the story I'm told, um, after that talk that I went to in the Village Hall by George Peterkin and a local naturalist that you may know, John Walters. And actually an event like that was a really brilliant way of bringing all those interested people into one place. And it's a case of, you know, do write your name down. Are you interested in kind of forming a group? And so a number of people sat down after the after the talk and formed a steering group. We thought, well, what should we do? How are we going to get people together? So the, the event had been really successful. You know, it was sold out. The, the village hall was, was full. So actually um, organising events has been one of the one of the sort of central things um, that this group does. And the other thing was a, um, a website which was funded by the Dartmoor National Park. The design of it was funded by them. Um, and this is a little screenshot actually from the front page of the website. So it's got, it's got a number of resources and all sorts of things about people's own journeys, I suppose, in terms of their meadow restoration. And members really are just people who join and sign up for events and news via the website. And they can also join an email group as well, which is a way of the, the group communicating with each other. And I would say that if you haven't had a look 
already do have a look at the website um, we've got lots of resources on there so this again is a, just a little snapshot of some of the things on there so um, we're trying to um, develop a, a longer list of contractors that definitely seems to be something that people are interested in um, getting help with doing various um, various jobs really that are on you know like cutting grass and baling and, and that kind of thing particularly if they've got quite small areas of land it can be problematic so we try and kind of put that kind of information on there there's courses workshops you can see the other other things on there and we also put quite there's quite an extensive uh, section of resources as well um, and in particular since since covid last year um, put a lot of effort into developing online resources so more meadows has a youtube channel and again this is just a little snapshot if you go to um, if you go to the youtube channel which is quite easy to find you'll see that there's all sorts of videos and there's lots of instructional videos there. And a lot of those were in response to a member survey that was done last year and people wanted access to find out more about how to do things. So, it, you know, how, how to um, manage your hedges actually. So it's not always just about meadows. Um, and we've got, you know, a couple of great talks up there, how to create a meadow. So I did say at the beginning, I wasn't gonna talk about meadow restoration. There's quite a lot of resources on here that do. So if you're interested, it's a good place to go. Um, so yeah, they get quite good views. I think the top viewing one went to um, Charlie Burrell <laughs> in Chagford Village Hall, which has got nearly 6,000 views or something crazy. So it's really nice that it sits there as a resource for people just to watch and pick up whenever, um, whenever they've got the time. Um, there's been uh, conferences. This was one in 2017, which was sold out. Um, really interesting, attracted all sorts of different people, not just from on Dartmoor. Um, and it's a really great way of kind of meeting people, meeting people of similar mind to you, really. Um, the other thing that we find is really useful are doing practical events, because what we do actually talk to the members. So as, yeah, as I said, a survey went out to really try and find out what people wanted from the group. Um, and it, it did come back a lot you know about training and how to do things so um practical practical events are always really popular and this is this is a scything workshop as you can probably guess um well the sides and did some id workshops this one's at Prince farm up on dartmoor um so plant ids invertebrate ids all that kind of thing again really popular because people want to know what's in their meadows they're really interested in in you know the results of their labors um, and it's something that if you start down that restoration process that you see change you know over time and even actually if you've got an old meadow that's been species rich for a long time you still see changes from year to year so it's it's quite interesting i think people find that of interest so who are all these people that belong to the group um they're really varied and the land that people manage is equally varied um, so there are some farmers in there, and this is Steve, who's actually a member of the More Meadow Steering Group, and he organises the Open Meadows every year. So that's a really, a really good event. It's just an um, opportunity for people to open their their meadows to the public. Um, but actually, what a lot of people like is a good excuse to go around and have a nose at other people's patches and find out what they've been doing, and just kind of do a bit of that that kind of linking up and have a bit of cake and that kind of thing um so i think it's it's really good and it gives it gives members of the public actually a chance to see things that are actually quite hard to see in the landscape these days you know that they're, they're often on private land there's not too many public areas are often will be you know maybe wildlife trust reserves and things but they're not things that you see um, around very much so this is an opportunity so um we're hoping to expand the Dartmoor idea across Devon next year. So again, if that's of something of interest to you, do check out our news and events section and um, and join in. So we have um, farmers. Steve probably trying to count his orchids there. He has a stupendous amount of um, 
different types of orchids in his meadows. This is Throwley Churchyard in North Devon, uh, North Dartmoor, sorry, um, which is amazing. I can't believe it when I went there. It just has a huge array of uh, different flowers and it's it's actually become a county wildlife site now. So it's quite interesting. And I assume we're gonna hear lots more about Churchyard shortly, so that's great. Um, shed roofs, why not? Even a shed roof. So the point is here really, it can be anybody um, with any little patch of any size really. Um, and we certainly have a lot of community groups that are managing public spaces. So I'll talk a bit more about that as well in a little minute or two. So one of the other um, things that's really popular on the website is a map where people can add their own meadows. So you see all the little pins, they represent where somebody's um, put their meadow on there. So the owners actually state, you fill in a little kind of few fields on the, on the website about whether it's in restoration, already species rich and et cetera. It does go through a bit of moderation um, and then a pin's put on the map with a bit of information you can see some information about somebody's meadow up there. Um, the green pins are on Dartmoor and the blue ones are outside the National Park. So, so far we've got 266 meadows within Dartmoor and that represents a total of over a thousand acres, which is pretty mind blowing actually. Um, but one of the things that's been increasingly happening is people outside the National Park are joining the group and that side of things is really growing. And uh, we've got 133 outside. Um, so a smaller, much smaller acreage, obviously less meadows, and some of them are quite tiny and some of them are sort of series of um, farmland kind of uh, meadows. So there's also um, an email group, which I mentioned, you can see the kind of conversations that people have about bumblebees and birds and chain harrowing and all sorts of things. So moving forward, um, we kind of thought, well, what next? You know, there's obviously an appetite for this. The, the, the model of the Dartmoor group, which has been going for sort of six years now, um, it took a while to get going, but then it, it's kind of, really seems to have roller coasted more recently um, was how can we kind of expand this across Dartmoor and make it relevant to other places really because um, a lot of the events were on on the moor um, you know the the sort of information I guess and some of the training and and also the types of meadows that people were looking at they're, they're kind of all relevant to that kind of upland landscape and a lot of people you know are managing grasslands in all sorts of other places so and they might not want to drive all the way to north north Dartmoor or whatever for an event so kind of thought well actually there's an appetite for this you know outside of outside of the national park so this year has been um very busy in that respect so this was something that i've been involved with was the development of um a wider network so this is the meadow makers forum which we set up at the beginning of the year um, and we've kind of changed the logo and the name slightly which does confuse people when you're saying it to them but this is just more meadows more and more meadows across Devon and beyond and the idea was that we have an online forum so it's a dedicated kind of communication platform for anybody who's interested um, in any of these kind of topics who just want to connect with other like-minded people um, across Devon and it is starting to become increasingly beyond Devon as now as, as well now so we have links on there to um, resources and information and we're looking at ways to further sort of support regional groups so the, the original Dartmoor group is a really good model for how this kind of thing can work and we were really keen to try and see if we could help support other groups um, around Devon. Um, so this was funded uh, with a grant from the Devon Environment Foundation. Um, the forum is free to join and we've got dedicated areas there for kind of regional local groups whatever people want to do really um, and we've actually got some fledgling <coughs> groups starting to appear it's quite a slow process, I think. People need to learn it's there. They need to kind of, um, you know, just get a feel for things. And some some people actually 
find it and they've already got that passion and enthusiasm and know that that's what they want to do. In fact, we talked to um, a, an artist actually in Somerset this week, um, who's just really passionate about doing something where she is and um, <laughs> is, ready, is ready to rock really, because actually um, it can be any sort of people, artists, ecologists, farmers, anybody can start doing something with a bit of support and some enthusiasm. Um, and probably the furthest along uh, group is um, the West Devon group. So um, it's it started off um, really with one chap up there who's he's quite knowledgeable, um, but mostly it's you know passionate really about the whole idea of um, connecting up people, of having some events that they could put on in their area. And in fact, one of the things that they're looking at, and it's something that's been discussed in other, in other parts of Devon when I've been talking to various groups, is um, trying to join up some of these habitats. So looking at where meadows, because um, so they're looking at a quite a local scale, really, um, of, of looking at trying to encourage people that own land that actually connect up some of these species rich meadows to the idea of kind of creating wildlife corridors so actually increasing exponentially the kind of value of, of that land for wildlife and they have a they've already got a little steering group if you want to call it that um, which I think they do um, and they've got um, someone from Devon Wildlife just on there. They have a research student on there. Um, there's a bit of interest from local councillors in that area. And it's just um, other people, anyone with a patch really, who's, who's quite keen. Um, so don't be put off by, you know, if, if people are, are kind of um, seem very lofty, you know, if they're doing research or whatever, it, it's, it's just the people that were in that area that, that have a passion. Um, so what can you do? So I've got a couple of little slides just to throw a few kind of ideas in the pot. Um, so some of you might recognise some of these uh, pictures, actually. I recognise some of the names in the <laughs> that we've got here. So you can join the forum. It's um, there for anybody um, who's interested. And as I say, we're kind of looking at ways that we can help support new groups. We certainly can help with um, organising events and that kind of thing and try and put people in touch with other contacts that we know are doing things in the area. So if there are um, contractors that work somewhere, um, we could kind of link people up together a, a bit. But actually, the forum does that quite well. It's one of the sort of um, purposes of it, if you like. Um, so local communities can look at managing their green spaces. So these actually, these two photos are from Buckfastly. Um, and the one on the left is the edge of one of our sports fields, which is looking amazing this year. And this is um, our Buckfastly Action for Nature group working on a small verge in town. And we'll be pinning that little mini meadow on the Moor Meadows map at some point as well. So um, just spread the word and you can talk to your local uh, town or parish council about some of the bits of land that they maybe have or manage um, and look about what you can do. You can think about your own green space. This is a sneaky picture that somebody sent me, but it's actually just of her front garden, I think, on an estate somewhere. She lives on a housing estate. Um, it's kind of quite a cause for lots of com conversations, I believe, <laughs> of all sorts. Um, but but the forum can give us give you advice for restoration. A number of people have done the No Mo May um, thing, the plant life um, project, and think about little garden mini meadows. And also, it's about finding like minded people in your community. So if you're a landowner or um a gardener whatever really then you know get involved and hopefully kind of scenes like this will be a little bit more of a common sight so i'm going to finish there say thank you and if you have any questions thanks tracy that's fantastic yes does anyone have any questions that they'd like to put to tracy <laughs> Any at all? Any hands up that I'm missing? I see a hand. Where is that? Hannah's. Hannah. Yeah, go ahead. Hello there. I'm already 
there's already thoughts whirring in my brain. I, I work in Torbay supporting green space groups for ah, um, Torbay okay. Council and Groundwork South. So oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and also I have a, a little mini meadow in my front garden. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely thinking about how I can get some of the groups connected up. Um, in terms of some of these are parks and green spaces. So at the moment, I would say they are mini meadows, but they're not wildflower meadows. Um, is, is there a definite distinction here or could it be any group that's just encouraging a little wild space on a green area? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's it's that picture I showed you at Buckfastly, that little patch is, is not that great yet. It's it's getting there, we're doing stuff and it's on its way. So I think it's it's just like I said, it's it's kind of a progression and it can take quite a while. And actually there are benefits. Um, I mentioned that I manage some um or I don't manage, but I'm involved in the management of, of one in Paynton. And actually seeing that change over the last 15 years mm. uh, has been really interesting. Where it started off, um, you know, a lot of it was quite rough and ready and not a lot of sort of what we think of as flowers, although grasses are flowers, <laughs> but uh, not much of that. And, and it, it, it comes eventually. Um, I think you need um, persistence. It depends a lot on your soils. Those beautiful meadows that I showed on Steve's land, um, he literally switched his management only maybe five or eight years ago or something. It wasn't like a huge long time. And he's got amazing meadows. So I think his soils were probably already kind of part way there. So it is a bit of a journey. In some places, you'll never get them to have all those flowers they might just be really fertile but they can still be really good places for um you know lots of other invertebrates that like different habitats and you can also look at things like having little bits of scrub if that's appropriate i think probably in an urban setting you know you just got to think about the multiple uses of the area as well but you can certainly um have it can certainly be better than a mown lawn that's for sure i think anything you do with it that moves it beyond that point then you're kind of heading in the right direction but um yeah I mean um I think yeah we have got some meadows or I've certainly spoken to people around that area uh, and we've wondered about a kind of tall bay group or something like that so it's mm -hmm. definitely scope for getting more people involved around that area and um and and swapping notes actually as, as much as anything and going and having a look at what other people are doing I think that's that's kind of a key thing to know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of people have and me until a certain point, but it should be flowers everywhere. <laughs> and, and actually grass is, is, is still yeah. meadow. So yeah, no, that's I really... think I think with public spaces, and I expect David will probably talk about this it's about managing expectations as well and things don't happen overnight um, and some sites lend themselves better to it than other sites because um, you know these species rich meadows wouldn't have been everywhere there would have always been some very fertile land that probably didn't have quite as many species but um, you know would have certainly supported wildlife and things in the past so yeah yeah but I'm sure you can get them more flowery. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Um, any other questions from anyone um, out there? No? Well, I've, I've got one. I've got one for you, Tracy. Um, if you say you've got a, an area of grasslands, what, what's, what would be your line on sort of introducing seed? Because these days we're seeing a lot of um, seed being introduced from various different sources and some of it can be you know include some things that we don't necessarily want to include in the countryside but sometimes it can be quite good would you say do, do more meadows sort of advocate introducing seed if it's from a good provenance or would you say in the first instance just to if you've got an area of grassland just to manage it and see what comes sort of what what would be yeah. your 
What yeah, your... so that's always the good first step, really, is before you dive in, is just to see what you've got. And I think people that have bought land or, you know, are working on a piece of land that they've not sort of seen through a year before, um, you should always just give it give it a season to see what comes up because you might be quite surprised um sometimes especially if it's a more urban area and it's been mown you know sort of bowling green level um you can be really surprised what what's in there because sometimes these bits of grass and are remnants of what would have been fields there once upon a time um so definitely worth having a look you can sometimes get an inkling if you peer down and have a little look amongst the grasses, how many other leaves are there there. Um, in terms of adding seed, um, if, you're, if you're in a rural area, I would say that you want to get local seed as far as possible. And one of the things that More Meadows is trying to do, and we have a lot of posts about this on the forum actually, is about trying to match people up. So if someone's got a really great meadow that's um, really good for perhaps being a donor site to, to be able to give seed or green hay to another site that's in the, in the locality, then that's a really good way of doing it. There are local seed suppliers. Um, there's Goran Farm in, in East Devon that does uh, local seed there. So obviously that's Devon provenance. Um, so, Things will tend to do better if they come from around where you live. And certainly if you're up on Dartmoor, you probably want to have seed that's, you know, from those upland areas rather than somewhere, somewhere else. Um, if you're in an urban area, I think you possibly got a little bit more, personally, I think you've got a bit more flexibility. I'd go for native and I'd go for, for nearby provenance if possible, but if that's not possible, you know, native and maybe a bit further afield is better. And often something's better than nothing. Um, and sometimes actually in urban areas, people do these kind of pollinator mixes, which I wonder if what Hannah maybe might have had in mind when she first started with this, where you see these amazing kind of pictorial meadows, but um, mostly they're annuals. So they're only there for the year. And a lot of them are non-natives, but they can be, they can look amazing and they can be really great for pollinators. So, um, but they sort of need to be in the right place. I think they can be quite nice in an urban environment. Um, but yeah, you've got quite a lot of scope. You've got to keep doing that though. I think the beauty of a perennial meadow mix is once you get it established, if you manage it right, and you've got those plants there for the duration. So less work ultimately. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's it's all about context, isn't it? And kind of what you're aiming for, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's brilliant. Do we have any other questions? Hannah, is that a is that an old hand? No, no. Uh, so one, I was going to say Trevor's yeah. got his hand up, um, but hasn't put his virtual hand up. So I was just flagging that. <laughs> um, oh, but okay. also, I was just going to say to Tracy, we're we're using our annual pollinators as a bit of a gateway drug to try yes. and get people hooked <laughs> on it. So uh, yes, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Trevor had his hand up. Good so. plan, Trevor. You need to unmute. You there, Trevor? There we are. Uh, there you go. Well, it's not it's not a question really. Um, some of you might know me. I'm actually the um, manager of Holy Trinity Churchyard in Buckfastley, and I think I'd like to really thank um, Caring for God's Acre, More Meadows, and I recently Tracy's group, The Bang or Buckfastley Action for Nature <laughs> Group, um, for with their technical and physical help in endeavouring to create something better than what we've got in the churchyard. So on behalf of those of us that go and maintain the place, thank you very much. Very good. Thanks, thank Trevor. You, Trevor. Brilliant. OK. Uh, I think we're good then. So I'll hand over to David, who will uh, talk to you about churchyards, which is his special area of expertise. So over to you, David. Cheers. Hey, thank you. 
Okay, everybody hear me okay? Yes? Thank you. Good, right. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Dave Curry. I, I work for the Diocese of Exeter, which in fact is the county of Devon. And um, I work managing their living churchyards thing. Just to put it into context, there are now 10,000 churchyards in the UK. 625 of those are in Devon. And when you look at it, that's the equivalent of a small national park. Their churchyards are unique and they're undervalued as well. Very few people talk about churchyards and its ecology. And I hope to change minds, that's my main thing. But what we must get together first is why are churchyards so important? Now here's a Saxon church with its cemetery. And there was literally plonked, let's say on the edge of Dartmoor, so you had a heathland habitat and the cemetery, the cemetery, the graves were dug within that heathland habitat. Some churchyards were actually built in woodland groves. So your churchyard cemetery would have a, a woodland flora, a woodland habitat, which of course has since been lost. So they once reflected the abundance wildlife of the countryside around them. Now they represent islands of refuge for plants and animals lost from the surrounding area. They are extremely important. Um, I'm biased, but they are extremely important. Now then, this is a churchyard. Thumbs down, <laughs> as you can see why. It's been manicured to an inch of its life. And the vicar comes and complains that he spends £1,200 on cutting the grass each year. Same again. But as Anna mentioned earlier, this is Throwley in North Dartmoor, which has been managed in a very, very good way. And as that, as a consequence, it's now a good site for marsh fritillary butterfly. So their grassland is managed to include devil's bit scabious, which is the um, caterpillar's food plant. <clears throat> and so this is just one good exemplar of a living churchyard. This is another one of my exemplars. Um, if you're around these churches, I do suggest you visit. This is All Saints in Oakhampton. It's outside the town, um, above the town. But here you can see just a, a, a section through the churchyard itself. Um, they came to me a few years ago. I wrote them on a management plan. And um, you can see the results. Another lovely little church, the Bear Ferrers, the St. Andrews. Again, tree planting, wildflower meadow planting, and they've got an amazing churchyard right next to the Tamer Estuary. Expectations, I think, is one of the major problems because people expect churchyards to be, as it says there, a single color of vibrant green with no interruptions and cut tight to the floor. And that is what is most attractive finish and what people want. So there's the first barrier, if you like, is expectations of what churchyards should be like. <clears throat> it's an expensive business. As I said, a vicar came to me recently and complained about the cost of spending £1,200 on um, cutting the grass to keep it manicured to within an inch of its life and to make it look as tidy as possible. Um, when it works, the grass starts growing. There are inevitable complaints from certain members, either of the congregation or the public, which tell me that it's untidy and it's disrespectful to the dead. <laughs> so those are two comments I have. And I am having quite a battle with certain elements of churches and communities which do not like 
long grass or meadow in churchyards. <clears throat> what we have to do, of course, then is to change our approach to managing our churchyard grasslands. Not only do you have to change the management, but you have to change the mindset. And that's where the problem lies. Management is easy. It's the mindset which is the problem. Speak for itself. <clears throat> we also get complaints of people going into their um, a family member's grave to find they have to hack their way through chest high grass. Um, so in other words, that churchyard must be managed accordingly. So we keep paths short and we maintain short grasslands around the graves which are regularly visited. And there's a good example. One of my other favorite churchyards is Hatherley Church in Oakhampton, uh, John the Baptist, I think. It's two acres in size. And when I wrote the management plan for that churchyard, they got a team together and they surveyed all the graveyard. And as you can see, where the graves are visited and uh, they, that area is kept short. But the blue areas, some of which are quite extensive, are unvisited and unmanaged. And so that has got a, an annual program of letting the grass grow long um, in these areas. At this moment, we're just cutting it in the autumn. And as Hannah said, just look and see what comes up and then you can alter your management accordingly. A good indicator of um, old grassland, don't forget what I said, um, these grasslands where the church was established, let's say on a heathland, and it wasn't until 800 AD when they actually put a wall around the churchyard. Up until then, it was just free and open. But for some reason in 800 AD, they decided to put walls around churchyards. Now just think of that, you are actually encapsulating this habitat. And since then, it hasn't been sprayed, it hasn't been plowed, it hasn't been managed in any way, except for the occasional six-foot hole. So within that grassland, you have some very, very good seed waiting to pop up. Ant Hill is a good indicator of grassland, and the rare you can see one there's been there a long, long time. What you see is like a glacier. What you see up top is just one tenth. The rest of it is nine tenths. And here, just six months ago, um, I had a, a vicar from a church in Devon who rang up about a complaint from an elderly gentleman who said there was an ant's nest growing adjacent to a child's grave. The ant's nest needs to be taken down and destroyed. And I've already emptied a tin of ant powder on it just to make sure. <laughs> Again, attitudes. Um, I rang the gentleman, had a long chat with him, and um, <laughs> he saw the light, as they say, and um, was quite happy with that remaining there. Sometimes I have to accept what the, the church parochial council says and that they, they insist on maintaining the grass to a decent level. So what I've done is... <clears throat> I've thought up of actually introducing mini wildflower meadows. <clears throat> there are loads of graves in churchyards like this with just inverted commas, weeds growing out of them. And what I recommend is that they are scraped off, taken all the vegetation off, and then they can either be planted with um, daffodils or whatever, or wildflower meadow seeds. And there you can see one there, one of our local churches. I'm looking forward to next spring. This is one which came up with the lovely daffodils earlier this year. So rather than try and convince <laughs> the church council that you know it's best to leave the grass grow long, I've accepted what their wishes and that we've actually created mini meadows throughout the churchyard. Here's some of the points and tips for managing meeting grass and churchyards. I've written a series of guidelines or guidance notes 
And you can find those on the Exeter Diocese website. And uh, they are guidance notes on churchyard management. I've done guidance notes on trees in churchyards, managing grasslands, lichens, and so on and so forth. So you can access those on the diocese website. So there are this, these are paragraphs from those guidance notes. <clears throat> and another problem too with this is the production of thatch, that sort of dead layer of almost impenetrable grass, and that needs to be removed so that the low grass is to come through. So we ask them, basically, let them grow from April through to at least mid-July, preferably later, something like September, something like that, and uh, just to see what comes through. And once these areas have flowered, of course, then you cut them using a strimmer, a scythe, or an Allen scythe. This is a good opportunity for training as well, um, skills training. So you can get experts in or whatever to show people how to use a scythe, a strimmer, or an Allen scythe or something like that. So you can involve the community in this. Break off the hay, remove. Very good uh, volunteer day. It can be stacked in a corner to create a wildlife habitat. It can be used as a source of seed or given away or sold as hay. But there again, it's again involvement of the community. Some churchyards, some churches will actually get rid of the, of the local farmer and uh, use the sheep to keep the grass down just for a season when it needs cutting. And one of the most important things, as soon as you stop mowing that grass and the grass grows an inch, that's when the complaints come in. So it's very, very important indeed to produce some form of notice board, which can be either at your church gate or in your church, um, southern, south porch or something like that. But it's very important indeed. Don't go ahead and start managing your grassland without putting up a notice to say why you're managing the grassland. This is a lovely notice in St. Michael's and, all, um, and Archangel Chakrid. Very good site. This is my, one of my exemplar churches. This is the Edwards Church in Plymouth. I was there yesterday having my sort of monthly look around it. Um, it's also got the Silver Ward and Eagle Church and managing the church it goes towards obtaining your Eco Church Award. And I do recommend you look up Eco Church on the website and see what that involves. It's very challenging, um, but that's what it's all about. And here's the green team at St. Edward's Church. As I said, I was there yesterday. They're doing an amazing job uh, in maintaining the site. There's four beehives in situ. There's... Um, a bee hotel, a bug hotel, a compost heap, a stream, um, a spring. And I have to explain to them that these springs are, in fact, the origins of the church because the spring was probably a pagan site and used for pagan worship. And then when the, when the, when the city, when the area was Christianized, to use a better term, they built the church on the pagan sites. And many churches have come to me and said, oh, we've got this spring in my churchyard, which is a nuisance. And I explain what it is, that it was the original pagan site. And there are several churches in Plymouth with springs in their churchyards. If there's a churchyard near you, have a look, see what you can find. So I asked the question, is there a green team in your church, and if not, try and encourage someone to be there. 
And again, this is very important. This is another very important aspect of managing a churchyard. A churchyard means a different thing to a different people, and you have to acknowledge this. So some will think that it's a pleasant, reflective place for the congregation and visitors. Some will think it's an environment in keeping with the function and burial and scattering of cremated remains. Some will think it's respected and cared for a part of our environment. And some will say it's a sanctuary for wildlife. They all have their ideas of what churchyards are for, and they all have to be acknowledged and respected before you can even think about managing the churchyard. This is a lovely site. This is an image from Moor Meadows. Um, this is my ultimate aim. <laughs> There we are. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, right. Toad. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. I, I was um, at the other end of the bars. Fantastic. Does anyone have any <laughs> questions for uh, for David on churchyards? Yes, Rob. Thanks, Max. Uh, well, I think really, in a way, you answered my question. The question I was going to ask David was, in the churchyard that I manage, St Mary's at Rattery, I would say the village is split halfway down the middle. Um, the vicar recently had a complaint, a letter of complaint to say they'd never seen the churchyard looking in such a disgraceful state, it was so untidy. And then other people have said, how lovely it looks with all the wild flowers. And I think my difficulty is trying to, as you say, please all the people most of the time. Yeah, you're right, yeah. I have put a notice in the, in the Lichgate notice board, but obviously that is, I don't think, I think my mistake is probably not publicizing what we're trying to do enough. People just think that the church is just being neglected rather than we are actually managing it yeah. in a wildlife-friendly way. Sort yeah, of yeah. I'm, I'm happy to come to visit churches, um, to give a talk, uh, a village talk, something like that. Yeah. And um, so you can invite all those along who are the dissenters. <laughs> oh, that's really useful. Yeah, um, Rattery is fine with me. It's when it starts getting into East Devon. I live in Plymouth. So North Devon is not possible and East Devon is not possible, but South and West Devon, I'm very happy. But I can get speakers for other parts as well. Right. well and I think that's the way to do it, is actually give a talk on the value of churchyards as a whole, not just flowers, but birds, butterflies, everything. Yeah, yeah. I'll probably need an expert like you to do a bit of convincing. Yes. <laughs> I don't think they really believe me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, somebody's asked about the guidance notes. The guidance notes I've written are on the Exeter Diocese website. If you put in church or management guidance notes, they should, <laughs> I hope, come up. If they don't, then email me and I will happily send them to you. What I do is I go to a churchyard on a request. I walk around the churchyard and say, what do you want? And I said, then I can say, well, look, this is what you can do. And then I put it into a project brief, which I've got a template for, and I can send you that template as well. And this explains to the PCC or whoever it is, what is, which can, what can be done within the churchyard. And then they take ownership of that and then take it through. So the church at St Andrews down at Bear Ferrers went to their PCC. They accepted every aspect of the report and they've implemented that report. Um, yes, they've had complaints just like you, but um, they've managed to overcome that. <laughs> and, um, and they've now done a, got a very good churchyard. Throwley is the same, it's another good churchyard. But yes, um, we do get a lot of complaints about churchyard management and long grass. If it goes above a centimetre in height, um, 
I've had one group who's um, flats were overlooking the churchyard and they actually reported it to their MP <laughs> yeah. as well, who wrote a letter to me and I wrote a very rude letter back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I lose patience. Um, somebody else who wanted to talk, question. Itty, if you got a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, is the, um, are the complaints and are the resistance from, uh, I mean, are they from all sorts of sites or are they from sites where maybe, I don't know if you've got it kind of signage or interpretation at every site? Because I definitely agree with you. I think in, um, signs are really useful. In fact, I was reading some research the other day that said, um, you know, that some people, for example, same with, I guess, you know, front gardens and things like that. You know, if someone's got an untidy, uh, garden they'll get complaints and things but then the second they put up a sign to say you know uh, pardon the weeds we're feeding the bees type thing suddenly people sort of stop and go, oh wow that's a really nice garden yes yes you're right um i try to encourage I've, I've even written the texts for each church to write one for rural churches the one for urban churches they've got no excuse <laughs> and um when as you say when they do that it explains what they're doing a lot of people will, you know, tolerate that long grass. If they don't, then you get the complaints. Mm. So, Rob, um, Rattery, get a notice up. I'll send you the text if you want it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it does, yeah. I have got notices up, but I think I ought to put something on the, on the website um, because I don't think people always look at a notice board in the, in the lich gate. And I yeah. put up a big picture of a lawnmower with a line through it in certain areas to show that we are we suspended mowing for um you know for rewilding. Yeah. But I still had complaints. So yeah, I've just reconnected with a very old friend. I was curator at Plymouth Museum of Natural History. He was curator at Exeter Museum, and we've met up again after fifty years. Oh, and wonderful. he comes around with me, and we have actually done a poster of the Oxide Daisy. So we can send that to churches to have it laminated and put onto their notice board. Right. And he's taking some lovely photographs of Oxide Daisies with all sorts of insects on, showing the life that you can get just in one plant of Oxide Daisies. Um, so we're doing that, and people are saying, well, why don't you do one each season? So we'll probably do that as well. Caring for God's Acre um, was mentioned earlier. They've done a very good A1 poster on living churchyards. And if you go to their website, Caring for God's Acre, CFGA, and see if you can get hold of their A1 poster on living churchyards. It's, that's another good one as well. Right. Right. Thanks, David. Um, David, could you just check in the chat that that's the right? I think Trace has just posted the uh, the link to the guidance notes you're talking about. Is that is that the right one? Where's that? Just chat. in the in the chat box there. I think Tracy's posted the link there. I think that's maybe the one you were talking about. Look like the right one. Yes, it yep. is. There we go. Brilliant. Okay. Fantastic, Hannah. If you got a hand up. <coughs> Yeah, sorry, me again. Um, I just wanted to ask, sometimes we get approached by members of the community who aren't maybe members of the, the congregation or the, the church community. And the church yard and grounds are our local green spaces for them. Um, what would the best advice be to give them? Would it be to approach the church to talk to them about how they might participate in, in looking after the grounds and, and ideas? Um, is that the best way to direct them? Yes. To speak to them directly. We are looking for two things, which are two people. One is a green champion. It's no good sending letters to the vicar, to the secretary, to the church warden, because they are swamped already with letters. So what we're looking for is a church, is a green champion in each church who will receive, and we will know that they will receive all the mailings and that sort of thing, and they can keep the rest of the church informed. And then with that church green champion, we can have a green team. So if there's just a few, three, four, five people who are interested in maintaining the churchyard for wildlife, 
they could form a green team and plan accordingly. I'm happy to, to visit and to advise and that sort of things. But I think it's essential to get a green team together. Don't try and do it for yourself. And as for public, they always walk past the gate because it is a cemetery. It is a churchyard. They never dream of coming in. And we're trying to convince churches to make people welcome during the summer. I mean, this month, this next month is um, creation month. And um, so I'm asking churches to open their doors, open their gates, serve coffee, tea and say, come in, see our beautiful lichens, you know, see our lovely flowers, our trees, the yew trees, the oak trees, the trees in graveyards are amazing. And there are some yew trees there which are two or 3,000 years old, and they've been there long before the church. I mean, look at Heavy Tree in Exeter, the church there. Heavy Tree, heavy tree, because that yew is huge. And it was there a long time before the church was there, and it's connected to the history. So the churchyard is a good place for mental welfare as well. And you can do that by, in fact, putting in seats overlooking the meadow where people can sit and just be quiet. So it's not just the ecological aspects, it's also the mental welfare aspects as well, which are increasing, especially after what we've been through with lockdown. So for an individual, I would say to them to approach the, the vic with it, but to say, I'd like to be the, the green champion for the church. Yes, potentially. yes, okay. yeah. Okay, if there isn't one. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, I had a question for you, David, actually, about, about management with, with churchyards. Sorry if you've already talked about this, but um, how how does it work with management? Do I, I guess it's probably variable, but do churchyards, do churches have their own management team or or do the council do it or do they contract it out? Is it, is it, quite, is it quite variable across the board? Yeah, there are two types of churchyards, open and closed. If the churchyard is open... That's under the management of the church itself, the PCC, the Parochial Church Council. They manage the churchyard. And sometimes they will bring in contractors to cut the grass every month. Or Mr. Jones will come in with his mower and religiously <laughs> mow that church every week. But closed churchyards are those churchyards where the, they cannot take any more burials. And so under the Closed Churchyards Act, 1898, that management reverts to the local authority, who, of course, don't want it because <laughs> they've got enough to manage. So sometimes I don't have to deal with the parochial church council. I sometimes have to deal with the local authority who have got their contracts. So when I say, can you alter the frequency? They say, ooh, deep in, take a breath. That means yeah. we've got to deviate from contracts. Yeah, And there we're on a, a new... <laughs> A new scheme altogether. But sometimes they are very good. Our director of cemeteries in Plymouth is excellent for the work she does for us. And um, yeah, we get on very well together. Yeah. Yeah, because I think, well, the, the churchyard you mentioned actually in Hevertree, it's about 100 metres over there from me. And um, oh, right. yeah, yeah I, th I think that is managed by Exeter City Council because I see contractors in there when they're managing it and it's it's not done very well it's, it you know, it's, yeah. it's cut at the wrong time and stuff so i was just interested to know sort of you yeah. know if, if that's always the case and as you say it, it depends doesn't it on yeah it's you have to talk nicely to the local authority um yeah. and they will deep and take a breath because it means they're having to change the contract. contract yeah yeah and the worst thing the worst person alive in churchyards is a man with a strimmer because they don't only strim the grass, they strim the bark off trees. In one of the churchyards I did in my last job in Hertfordshire, I planted 48 fruit trees, or they planted 48 fruit trees under my guidance. And there was a closed churchyard, so three weeks later, I met the strimmers and just about strimmed off every tree from its fruit, you know, from the fruit trees. So you have to be careful. Um, so first of all, make sure what your church is open or closed. And if it's open, of course, then you've got to find the, the, the volunteers to actually manage your churchyard. Um, if it's to do with trees, get your local tree wardens. The tree council has tree wardens nationally and locally. And you can perhaps bring in 
and tree wardens to help me manage your trees and things. Or manage, no, keep your eye on, monitor the trees, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, thanks David. Do we have any more questions for David? Roger, have you got a hand up? Roger Swinfin. I think you're on mute. Oh, there we go. Oh, turn yourself off. <laughs> there we go. Right. Um, yes, I'll just say, um, David, um, don't be too hard. Um, don't, um, so this is something that's not going to be achieved overnight. Um, it's, um, I, I perceive there is, there's already uh, a, a, a change. More people are appreciating sort of um, grass verges that are not cut as frequently, um, roundabouts um, that provided they're not dangerous, uh, the sort of with, with, with flowers. Um, and uh, the sort of uh, thinking of sort of, uh, David knows I'm involved in marine conservation. And, you know, this is something that's it's been pegging away for years and, yes. And, yes. and progress has been made. And, and I think already with Wildflower Meadows, a lot more people are aware and appreciate the wildflowers than than a few years ago. Um, just keep at it. Don't be, don't be too hard. Tolerance. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Nice to hear from you again after such a long time. Um, Yes, David, that's why I'm here. But um, in our family, Barbara's the one who's um, in charge of our wildflower patches. Um, and But uh, seeing your name, uh, I, I couldn't resist asking uh, for, a, for a ticket to, to, to come and hear you again. <laughs> Thank you. Any last questions before we close? Just scrolling through, I think we're all good. Brilliant. Okay. Well, in that case, we'll leave it there. And a uh, huge thanks to, to Tracy and David for those really inspiring talks. Um, very exciting that so much is going on and uh, lots of opportunities to get involved as well. So, um, yeah, I think uh, next year we can look forward to some uh, some good grasslands coming into flower and, and hopefully putting some management practices in place if you've got a, a little bit of green space or maybe get in touch with your... Uh, local church so um yeah so i think we'll we'll leave it there the next webinar will be cat is it will it be in october we haven't quite decided on what it will be yet but if um i'm sure um, most of you all know where the page is it will be the towards the end in a in a couple of weeks time on uh devon's special bees wasps and ants oh, <laughs> oh yeah completely forgot so have we got john walters for that one Yes, I believe we do. Ah, uh, we've got the very famous naturalist John Walter, so that's going to be exciting. Um, so look forward to that, and hopefully we'll see some of you there for that one. But until then, thank you very much, and we shall bid you good evening. So goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks goodbye. for tuning in. <laughs>